be, or, or, or to put it more strongly, a bit of a gimmick, but there must have been a reason, an artistic reason, that you wanted to be involved in this. Yes, so um, I've put together the whole movement program for this, what, the, what If the City is a, uh, a Theatre, and this um, whole program is an incredible sort of collection of work from different artists from across Wellington, and we've galvanised pretty quickly to create it, and it's free to the public uh, over the month of February. So when I was putting together um, the program, the movement program, I was just really interested in coming up with new ways um, for performances to be outside, especially in our current environment, that that are different to, than what we've done before. So that's where it came from. What are the details if people want to see it? Uh, so they can look online. Um, there is a whole program on online. Uh, there's something in there for everybody. But the Scooter Ballet is on the 18th. 19th, 20th and 21st on the Wellington waterfront at lunchtime and on the 21st is at 3 o'clock um, so it's moving and um, yeah you'll have to sort of seek it out to find us but we'll be along this the is, waterfront. This is sorry February or March? February Great. yeah. Good luck it's going to be a fun project and uh, and lots of fun for people who get to see it as well thanks Malia. Yeah no thanks thanks for having me. Malia Johnston who is in charge of uh, choreographing this performance arcade festival performance of Ballet on flamingo scooters. New research, it's uh, 7 to 2 by the way, new research warns that New Zealand is at risk of failing to achieve its goal of being predator free by 2050. With me in the Auckland studio is doctoral student Zach Carter from the School of Biological Sciences and he's here to tell us why that is and what we can do about it. Hi Zach. Hey Jesse, thanks for having me. Nice to talk to you as well and you're not uh, a born and bred New Zealander. That's correct. I'm from Michigan in the States. How did you get interested in our predator-free movement? Um, well, I contacted my supervisor, James Russell, at the University of Auckland. I liked um, his approach and his research, um, so I shot him an email, and he uh, gratefully accepted my offer of, of being a PhD student, took me on, and here we are. Here we are. I'm glad to be here and not back there. <laughs> and, the, and the idea of exterminating mammals would have seemed pretty strange for someone living in North America as a conservation movement. Honestly, uh, before this, before moving here, I had never heard of that. Um, so it's a really interesting approach, um, a really interesting conservation intervention, and, and I support it. So What was it about Sir James Russell that, um, that made you seek him out? I was really interested in his um, macroecological approach um, to, to science. Um, he t looks at the big picture, and he doesn't usually take one specific approach. Um, so I thought there was a lot that I could learn um, from joining his lab, and it's been, it's been a great pleasure. How yeah. long have you been here for? I've been here for three years and some change. Um, hopefully can continue as well. And you've got interested in New Zealand's uh, native wildlife and our, and our quest for sort of that predator-free goal. Yep, that's, that's exactly right. Uh, so most of my, my PhD has been centered around prioritizing eradications for the benefit of predator-free 2050. Um, yeah, so I, I believe in it. Um, I, I kind of have to, I guess, since I've, uh, I've been doing it for the last few years. What's your favorite New Zealand native? Um, I'd probably have to say the kakapo. It's definitely my favourite. Great. It's yeah. a popular choice. <laughs> What's your favourite? Uh, oh, that's a good question. I'd probably have to go for something small like a peripetus. Ooh, like that. ooh nice. Yeah. It's a deep cut. <laughs> so tell us the bad news. Well, let's... Um, so, so I think maybe on first thought um, and, and first glance, this may be bad news. This may look um, like, like a pessimistic uh, result. So what we found was that... Um, based on the, the history of, of eradications in New Zealand, we're currently not on track to meet that predator-free 2050, that year 2050 goal. Um, but the good news, um, what we found is that, um, is that New Zealand requires transformative technologies in order to achieve it. So things, um, so, so for example, um, species-specific toxins, um, novel social uh, processes, um, um, highly effective lures for traps, um, those things will be required in order to achieve this goal. But what's good is that we are actually um, taking steps to make sure that these become a reality. Um, so New Zealand is doing what it needs to in order to achieve uh, predator-free 2050. Okay, but you've just measured it and you don't think it's moving quite fast enough. Right. So the, the study was based on the history of eradications in New Zealand from the past. So from 1980 uh, to current. And based on the, the rate at which eradications are succeeding from those, if that continues, that means we won't actually achieve the goal. We won't have achieved, um, eradicated all islands 
Can you there was it? an interesting, uh, it was almost like our version of Moore's Law, but uh, was it every 10 years we were able to eradicate an island twice the size of the last one? That's exactly right. So it's exponentially increasing. But what's what we what makes us think that we need these new tools is that the actual um, the trajectory is actually starting to flatten out. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's telling us that we need something new. Yeah, and that was anticipated by the people who announced the Predator Free Twenty Fifty. Although it was a big broad brushstroke thing, uh, they did note that it wouldn't be possible unless people came up with some innovations. Uh, there are some interesting ones around. You talk about lures. You know, I'm familiar with the work of Michael Jackson and. Uh, in Victoria University, who's doing some pretty amazing work on lures. Uh, novel social processes. And does this refer to the fact that we're sort of out of non-habited uh, islands or uninhabited islands to eradicate, and now we're looking at places like Waiheke and Rakiura Stewart Island, and we need to get people on board with what we're doing? That's that's exactly right. You hit the nail on the head there. Um what we found is that the greatest benefit, the greatest immediate benefit to the predator-free um, initiative, will be um, processes that can um, change change the way people think and, and believe about predator-free 2050. So, um, if we can gain community buy-in, we will significantly increase our chances of achieving the goal. Um, so things, so like what you said, so. Um, so social um, impact assessment is, is one of those novel processes that actually seeks to understand uh, local inhabitants, stakeholders, to understand their needs and their desires uh, for eradication or, or lack thereof and actually understand maybe why they don't want something to occur or if they do, um, why that is. Yeah. Um, and then you can target that and to actually facilitate um, intervention. Right. An easy example of that was what's happened with 1080, where it's sort of split into fours and against and a lot of non-communication happening there, just a lot of sort of angry words. That's exactly right. Yeah. Really divisive. Okay. What about these species-specific um, solutions? Ta- ta- so the species-specific toxins uh, like norbermide, um, so it only affects rats um, and it leaves other species, um, uh, it, it doesn't affect them as much. So issues, for example, with kia that are um, eating mm-hmm. poison baits from 1080, um, um, where there's bi-kill, this significantly re- reduces that and affects only the species that we want to target. Is it making progress with that? I believe so, yep. Uh, uh, yes. Okay. That's exactly right. How much longer are you going to be in New Zealand for? Um, I hope, hope many years. Oh, great. <laughs> what are you going to work on next? Um, well, I'd, li- I'd like to do a postdoc, um, hopefully something um, eradication related as well. Um, if I can, I'll continue working with Predator Free. I really believe in it, so... I'm here for the long haul. Great. Nice to talk to you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Zach Carter, who is originally from Michigan, came to work with around New Zealand academic James Russell and looking at whether we are on track, which we aren't quite, but hopefully we will be soon to achieve that goal of being predator-free by 2050. That media conference and New Zealand Live on the way. RNZ News at 2. Good afternoon. I'm Marama Tipole. The Immigration Minister Chris Farfoy is about to give a media conference at the Beehive. We'll cross to that when it begins. A 41-year-old man has been arrested after a police officer was beaten for what the police say was a prolonged time. Bystanders filmed the assault and shared it on social media. The officer suffered facial injuries, but Auckland District Commander Superintendent Karen Malthus says it is incredibly fortunate the injuries were not worse. She's concerned that a number of bystanders witnessed the assault and some filmed it and shared it on social media. Other police eventually tasered and arrested the man. A 41-year-old man has been charged with resisting police, injuring with intent possession of methamphetamine and escaping police custody. He is due to appear in the Auckland District Court today. There are no new cases of COVID-19 in the community. The COVID-19 Response Minister Chris Hipkins says that's good news for people looking to travel over Auckland Anniversary Weekend. There are no restrictions in place on events or travel, but the Director-General of Health Ashley Bloomfield is urging people to use the COVID Tracer app and stay home if feeling sick. All of the close contacts of the two most recent community cases have returned negative results. Dr Bloomfield says genome sequencing of two cases in the Pullman Hotel who arrived on different days in the last two weeks have been linked. He says environmental testing is underway to assist the investigation into how the infection was transferred between guests. 
An employee at a managed isolation hotel in Auckland has lost their job after an, an encounter with an isolated returnee in their room that lasted 20 minutes. Hello, good afternoon. Um, the most important task that the government and New Zealanders have is keeping Kiwi safe from COVID-19. And that's why in March last year, the government took unprecedented action to close the borders. That has created challenges, but that has kept our economy and our communities moving. The restrictions at the border mean that New Zealand citizens and residents and those who meet criteria for entry into New Zealand are able to cross the border. And it is critical that we hold the line to keep Kiwi safe. Officials have been communicating with the crew of the foreign flagged cruise ship La Le Perouse that is just outside our EEZ. 61 of the 90 crew on board have twice been declined critical worker visas. Despite being first notified last Friday that the 61 crew, such as hairdressers, bartenders and masseuses, had been declined visas, the ship that had already set sail for New Zealand continued on its course. A second application for visas was submitted on the 21st of January and was declined on Wednesday and the ship continued its voyage to New Zealand and only began hovering outside our EEZ this morning. The ship is being contracted by a New Zealand firm that intended to and I believe has already begun marketing and selling cruises here in New Zealand. I want to make it clear that our border is closed. New Zealand citizens and residents and those with valid visas and border exceptions are the only people we will let into New Zealand. Those that have come to New Zealand without visas and have no other good reason to be granted a visa at the border have been turned around. And that is what will happen to the 61 crew on board who do not hold visas on that cruise ship. Officials are currently talking to the ship about their options. At this stage, those options are that it turn around and refuel and restock somewhere else. If it cannot do that, the ship will be escorted to port. If it docks, the ship and 29 of the 90 crew who do have visas approved for maintenance could stay for the maintenance. The 61 other crew will be required to leave New Zealand as soon as possible. The other option is for the ship to dock, to refuel and restock for food and leave immediately. Those discussions are taking place right now. It is extremely important that I add that while the ship was given Ministry of Health clearance to undertake maintenance work here in New Zealand and to deliver the ship here for the New Zealand business, a key condition of that was that all crew have the appropriate visas for the purpose of the journey. The ship departed for New Zealand with a crew of 90 on the 10th of January, two days after they submitted an application for visas. At that stage, the application had not been fully considered. The application was declined on the 22nd of January. The ship kept sailing. A second visa application was submitted on the 21st of January and was declined this Wednesday. Despite being declined, the ship kept sailing. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm advised it began hovering outside our EEZ this morning. New Zealand takes its border security extremely seriously, especially given the threat of COVID-19. A message needs to be reinforced that processes around the border are in place to keep us safe. Those people or businesses that want to bring people into New Zealand need to know that those processes need to be followed or New Zealanders are put at risk. The New Zealand government demands that and, the New and New Zealanders demand that. The New Zealand firm that has contracted the ship, I understand, has begun marketing and selling cruises before the process played out. I can charitably call that unwise. There will be some who have bought cruises and who will have relied on work on those cruises. I sympathise with inconvenience. To any customers, any questions around that need to be directed to those who you purchased your tickets from. Where we can, we are allowing limited exemptions for people to come to New Zealand, and there are well-established processes for that. Getting ahead of those processes creates risk for businesses and for people, and that has occurred in this case. Balancing the need to keep us safe and our economy moving is extremely important, and the best economic response is a strong health response, and that is why we must keep a strong uh, and that is why we must be strong at the border. Happy to answer any questions. Just the crew on board, no passengers? Just the crew. You said you would charitably call this unwise. I mean, looking at this, they failed to adhere to basic instructions. 
I mean, isn't that a little bit too letting them get off scot-free here? It's, it's stupid, right? Well, I'm being diplomatic, but they are facing the, the consequences of not following the process properly. What's the name of the company? Um, I will have to make sure I get that for you. It's somewhere here, but I don't have it at the moment, but I'll get that for you. 49 people who had their... I haven't, so I haven't spoken to the company, so that's why I'll, I'll make sure I get that for you. The 29 people who had their visas granted, what exactly... So they are, they are critical for making sure that the ship can sail. As I mentioned, the other 61 are the likes of hotel staff, um, you know, bar staff, wait staff, masseuses, hairdressers, etc., et who um, Immigration New Zealand disease weren't critical for the purpose of the journey of the cruise ship here. Did they first seek visas, sorry? Their first application for a visa was submitted, I believe, on the 8th of January, and they set sail for New Zealand on the 10th of January. Is there any likelihood that, that under any circumstance the, the people who have been denied visas would be allowed visas, or is, are they quite clearly not critical? You mentioned masseuses. Well, the, the purposes of the trip are for maintenance. Of, so the purposes of those who have been approved uh, visas are for maintenance and to deliver the ship here to the New Zealand company. So again, it's engineering uh, start, um, engineering crew and those critical crew are, are, are there. Immigration New Zealand deemed on two occasions that those additional 61 staff, who again are akin to hotel staff, weren't necessary for, for, for the journey that they were approved. So the, the eventual passengers on the ship would be New Zealand tourists? Engaging a domestic cruiser. So my understanding, again, I haven't seen the marketing for the for the, for the cruisers. Is that they were going to offer domestic cruisers here in New Zealand. The Prime Minister made it pretty clear last week with the the case of the Wiggles that people should have all their eyes dotted and their t their t their t's crossed and their eyes dotted. Yeah. Um, is it disappointing for you to see that a, a company like this has just completely ignored the Prime Minister's recommendation? Yeah, look, as, and as I say, um, those processes have been in place for some time. So making sure that you are across the processes and understand exactly what the criteria are important. And I would have thought that you would try and do that before you put 90 people on board a ship getting to the when, when, when did immigration, when did immigration um, grant or deny the, the visa request? So there are two applications. The first application, I believe, was submitted on the 8th of January. That was declined on the 22nd of January. A second application was submitted on the 21st of January, uh, and that was declined by Immigration New Zealand on Wednesday. Do we have any obligations over the welfare of those on board? Uh, yes, and that's why the officials are talking to those on the ship. Um, they have requested to come to New Zealand to be able to restock and refuel, but ascertaining whether or not um, that is necessarily is a kind, the kinds of discussions that are going on at the moment. As I say, there are three options. They turn around, they, they, they come to New Zealand and some of them can stay, um, or they turn around, they come to New Zealand and all of them go as well. Is that processing time good enough for, for the visas? January the 8th till the 22nd seems so like I'm a long told, time I, when... Well, uh, it is, but also I think um, I, I've been told that it usually takes a week for a standard uh, application. We are talking about 90 applications for visas here, so it's it's large and it's complex. And as I say, the Ministry of Health wrote to the... Um, to the company on the 18th of December saying you have to apply for visas. They had between the 18th of December and the 8th of January to do something, and they only had, um, applied for those visas on the 8th of January. Was there, was there warnings given to them at that point that so they in, would in, not in the, in the, sail until their visas In the letter granted? by the Ministry of Health, it was made very clear that one of the key, key criteria for them was that everyone on board need to have, needed to have the requisite visas. Is the Defence Force being deployed? No, um, no, they have not been deployed. Uh, we're speaking to officials about if they were to come and port New Zealand, uh, what would happen? Um, I've been told that they probably will be escorted by who we don't know yet. Advance, not so at this stage that. because we're still in discussions about what the um, what the ship might do. There's a lot of resources going into this now, officials having to work with the cruise ship. How frustrating is that, that all these resources are having to be used to deal with this palaver, if you like? Oh, I wouldn't call it frustrating. We, as again, we need to make sure that we're vigilant with the processes at the border because New Zealanders are relying on it. And if people aren't making themselves aware of that um, or ride roughshod over the process or don't make logical decisions, uh, then these kinds of things um, can happen. Is it frustrating? Yes. Um, but I think it will be extremely frustrating for the people who may have been relying on those cruises when the cruise ship company didn't get its ducks in a row. Yes. If that cruise ship is uh, escorted into a port and those non-critical workers then have to leave, how exactly is that going to work? Are you going to is is it going to have to be transport organised for them to go to the airports to get the next flight? Yeah, that's what officials are, are working on. But just be, those sixty-one um, crew do not have visas, 
So in one way, shape or form, they will either not be allowed to leave the, the ship and will be transported straight, or will be, de or will be, or will be detained until they are able to leave New Zealand. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, that's what officials are working through now. 61 people, a lot of people, so the officials are working through that now. That's why our, our, probably our best course of action is that they turn around before they get here. Which country are they coming from? So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a range of nationalities, but it's a French flagship. Is that, a, is, that a, is that a warning shot to them, turn around or be detained here in New Zealand? No, it's, it's just that they've got options. Um, some of that may be, um, um, the demands of that may be what, what kind of fuel and stock they have. Um, officials are going through that now, um, but they don't have visas. If they come to New Zealand, 61 people will be going home. What is, what is, what is, what is, what is your message to that? Well, uh, they will be paying the bill for making sure that their people go home. And are you, you're, you're convinced that this company had, had sufficient knowledge before making these plans that these workers wouldn't have been... So this ship, I understand, has, uh, was originally um, uh, operating in New Zealand uh, back when there were no border restrictions and left when they were. They've been trying for some time to get uh, border exceptions to come into New Zealand. And on December the 18th, the Ministry of Health said for a very specific purpose, uh, you can apply, we're allowing you to come in, but visas... Uh, are one of the criteria for that. They did not apply for those visas until the 8th of January and departed to New Zealand on the 10th of January before those applications could be fully considered. Are you Does that seem like it makes sense to crew flexible? that ship with New Zealand workers? I mean, you can't train an entire workforce for something like that. So, and again, our border is closed. There are plenty of companies now who would love to bring in people because there are skill shortages, but our border is closed and they are, would be frustrated. Uh, for the government to allow those um, crew to come in uh, and do that um, when others have been declined would set an extremely bad precedent because there are criteria in place. Is there one uh, people who possibly might be deported? Would they have to spend 14 days in isolation before Depending being... on how quickly they would be able to leave, officials are working through that now. Where did the ship set sail from? So I understand it left Singapore on January the 10th. So if a company was wanting to operate a cruise ship in New Zealand, they could do it if they hired New Zealanders and only brought over critical staff? Would that still be possible? Well, look, um, that, that is one that is It is extremely challenging for people to get critical staff at the moment. There are an abundance of uh, sectors and businesses who would love to bring staff in that they can't, uh, when they can't get people in. But sending those staff um, in a cruise ship when they don't have their visas um, are, are either considered or approved, I think, is very unwise. MB, did MB tell the ship to dump those that don't have visas in New Caledonia? I'm not aware of that. Would that, would that be responsible of us? I'm not aware of that. What's the timeline going forward from here? Have you set an ultimatum to the, the ship's captain to say you've got to tell me by uh, midnight tonight whether but, you're going home? But there, or... there are no ultimatums, um, but there is a very clear message to those people that if they come here, they're either um, going to be leaving on a plane or leaving on the same same ship. So that is, the, that is what the officials are working through now, understanding exactly what they are, um, their situation is in terms of fuel and rations on the, on the ship. Expect to hear back about that. I'm speaking to them, to them on a regular basis, so um, I'd, I'd like it to be dealt with as fast as possible. Are you compelled to talk to the public about this today because stuff was going to publish a story, and if not, I mean, when were you going to talk about this? Well, we, we did get a media inquiry, but this has been an issue that we've been dealing with for the last 24 hours. And again, we want to reinforce, as we did last week, that if people come, uh, that people try and come into the country without the processes and the I's dotted and the T's crossed. We won't let them do that. The border is closed for a very good reason. Well, whenever we're ready and we're doing that now. This is the second sort of high-profile incident of a, of a company kind of marketing something to, to people, selling a product, but not having filled out the requisite paperwork. Are you, are you seeing increased incidences of, of companies doing this? And would, would you send a message to... Well, that, that, again, that is one of the reasons why we are doing this today, to tell people that they're, they're of the situation and reinforcing the message that there are exceptions. Uh, and if you don't, um, have, if you're not a New Zealand citizen or resident and have a, a, a visa with a border exception, then you can't come in the country. There has there is continual pressure for us to bring bring, um, especially um, critical, I mean, staff with specific skills into the country. That is never going to go away. But the the point that we're making today is extremely unwise to start sending those staff with a, when the visas aren't sorted. Apart from the Wiggles and this boat, uh, have there been other cases that, that you're aware of, of of companies selling services that they do not have the staff? Not that to I'm aware of got to the point where they're sitting just outside our EEZ when they set sail on January the 10th. Why has no one at any point on that journey told them to go home? 
because they haven't come into New Zealand yet. Uh, and there has been continual discussions between the ship and the ship's agents about what their options are. When they're sitting just outside our EEZ, it's time for us to give them a pretty clear message that it's time to turn around, or if they're going to come to New Zealand for a specific purpose, because don't forget, they do have approval to come here for a specific purpose, 61 of the crew are not necessary for that. You, we, did you know that they were on their way? Did you know that they had 90 people? Did you know that 61 of them were so not I was, going to get a I think I was first made aware of this about last week when the first application was declined. And as I say, you would have thought logically they would have turned around. But as I said in my opening comments, they did not. Just, just could, we be, could we have been more proactive there, though? Could we... Well, we've given them the opportunity to put a, another visa application in. We can't, we can't stop them in the middle of international waters uh, heading to New Zealand, but we're, uh, when, we're, when, they're on the, uh, when they're hovering on the verge of the EEZ, it's time to say you've got very few options. Just in terms of the marketing of these sorts of events, uh, I mean, is that getting close to sailing against the wind in terms of the Fair Trading Act, if they're offering services that knowingly they can't deliver on? Look, I, I think I should probably know that as a Minister for Minister of Consumer Affairs. But again, I think there's going to be some big reputational risk for these companies if they start offering services that they can't deliver. What do you say to the 700 or so Kiwis that have booked? Uh, I sympathise with you. If you've got any questions, speak to the company uh, who you put, purchased your tickets from. It is a huge inconvenience, but those companies who are offering those services would be wise to make sure that they have a ship and a crew before they start selling tickets. Do you expect them, all of the 700, to be given full reimbursement? I don't know. That's up to the company. Um, again, any questions that those people, any questions that those customers may have, will be best put to the company itself. Thanks, Max. You'll be talking to the French uh, ambassador about. Yeah, any diplomatic kind of uh, look, the, the, uh, my understanding is that the French ambassador was in, uh, involved in some discussions either with the agents of the ship or the ship itself. Um, that didn't come to, to anything, so obviously the message is being sent to, to the company itself, uh, the ship's agents and the crew. Just, just again, do you think it is responsible for a government agency to tell a crew ship to dump their staff on a Pacific island? And, I, and again, Jenna, I don't know if that happened. So I'm not giving you an opinion on what is a hypothetical for me. Did it happen? Is that responsible of us? No, well, I don't know if it, it did happen, so I'm not going to comment on that unless I know it's an absolute fact. Thank you.